Bonjour everyone, welcome to Reporters, our showcase of the best France Fanquette stories from around the world. I'm Jeannie Gaudula. On September 28th in Guinea, security forces fired into a crowd of protesters angry over the country's military regime. Human rights groups say over 150 people were killed and dozens of women raped by troops. Since then, international pressure has been mounting against both the junta and its leader, Captain Moussa Dadi's camera. Now, he came to power in a bloodless coup in December. Back then, he promised that he would not run in the upcoming presidential elections. He now seems to be changing his mind. And as the months go by, Captain Camera's behavior has become more and more erratic. He gives rambling late-night speeches on TV, receives journalists in his bed, and perhaps most worryingly denies any responsibility for the violence at Conakry Stadium. France Franquette correspondent Virginie Ertz got an exclusive behind-the-scenes look into the life of the man who's now running Guinea, Here's her special report. Camp Alpha Yaya Diallo. For the past nine months, this military barracks has been the seat of power in Guinea. It's from here that the junta and its chief, Captain Daddy's camera, run the country. Come on in. You're in the president's chamber. You're among friends. Yes, this is my place. It's 6 p.m. on Sunday. Captain Dadis is resting after a sleepless night. He's agreed to receive us in his bedroom. And he speaks about himself in the third person. The international media know exactly who this man is. A man's greatest attribute is education. It is thanks to my father that I am who I am, because my humanism is that of the man who nurtured the education in me, an uneducated, illiterate father but a modest, honest man. And there you have my poor grandmother. She's still with us, just celebrated her 100th birthday. And my son there, my daughter. Camera's daughter, who has just graduated from high school, is one of his closest advisors. We always told Dad power comes from God. Always remain on the side of the people and do what the people tell you to do. Step forward if they tell you to, and if they don't, don't force it. You must do what he's always done. Money or material possessions don't interest him. From his bed, Captain Daddy's camera seems to have been touched by divine inspiration to declare he's going to run for president. Guinea will become a democracy because the people will it. This is what we are left with, positive thinking, the nation for the moment, whether I should run for president doesn't interest me. I need, above all, the people's moral support. I am the father of the nation. That's what destiny has ordained. The head of the junta then appears in the antechamber, quite relaxed. <laughs> This room, so close to the heart of power, is forever occupied. Here, hangers-on rub shoulders with uniformed ministers and ordinary citizens seeking an audience. And the red berets of the presidential guard are the keepers of the temple. The Red Berets follow the head of the junta everywhere. His heavily armed guards are feared by the people. They accuse the guards of having fired on protesters on the 28th of December. About a thousand of them serve Captain Daddy's camera, who they call father. <laughs> The father is right. He's right in everything he says. We can't say anything against him anyway, because he is exactly right. In this army, it's the rule of the strongest. For example, if we want to go on about your rights, well, we know nothing about that. All problems for us pass through us by the gun. <coughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> 
If, for example, His Excellency told you there was no discipline in the army, well, maybe, if you want to go on about your rights, we won't listen. The soldiers, in other words, feel they are above the law. Independence Day, four days after the massacre in the Conakry Stadium, under heavy pressure, the head of the junta has been forced to admit that some soldiers fired live rounds, but he pleads not guilty. He says the soldiers in question were uncontrollable. By way of excuse, he evoked indiscipline in the army. I inherited an extremely difficult situation. Regarding what? Regarding this army. I need time to restructure the army, to make a complete overhaul, to give more rights to the military so they'll stay in the barracks. Besides, you will see the Minister for Defence is going to get more camps built. When soldiers are billeted with their families, you see the benefits. The men are more incorporated into the army. I think that's one condition for a better election. Thank you. While the president remains close to his army, across town on the Great Mosque Esplanade, trucks bring the bodies of victims of the stadium massacre. Relatives have come en masse to identify them and recover personal effects. <laughs> Some relatives wander among the tents carrying a picture of missing loved ones. There are only 58 bodies here, though NGOs put the death toll at 150. I can't find either of the two people I'm looking for. Nor can I. I lost my son, Mamao Mika Diallo. I haven't seen him since last Monday, not a sign of him since. I can't find anyone either. I lost two of my friends. We were together that day from 8 until 11 o'clock. I lost two people, my brother-in-law, some witnesses say he was shot in the stadium, witnesses say he was shot, and my brother I haven't seen since Monday, he's not here. They're not here? He's not here, we can't find the body. All those that were shot have been buried. They took other bodies from the hospitals and brought them here. They buried all those they shot. Witnesses have told us that. It's impossible to verify whether the soldiers did do away with the bodies. But the people are convinced, and tension mounts as youths attack security forces. They throw stones and are met with tear gas. In half an hour, the mosque is evacuated of the faithful during Friday prayers. A symbol has been attacked, and once again the crowd accuses the junta. The international community is raising pressure on the military rulers, whom it accuses of having planned the bloodbath. On the back foot, Didri's camera attacks the opposition. The opposition led a smear campaign in the West, in the United States. That's all they have. They have no weapons. Their movement is purely Machiavellian. On this day, he invited a number of journalists to lunch to persuade them he was the only man capable of saving the country by whipping the army into line. No civilian can manage the army. Even we military men have problems with this army. Even us military men have problems. Daddy's camera's entourage say only he can guarantee peace in the country. If we were to leave the hot seat today and put a civilian in our place, in 24 hours he'd be overthrown by another soldier because nobody can control these troops. Does that not make Moussa Dadi's camera a dictator? No, the president, I knew him before he became president. If the army chose him to lead the country, it is because they know he is a good and a, and a generous man who wouldn't hurt a fly. And the press charm offensive continues into the night with the presidential motorcade. As it passes through Conakry, crowds gather round, drawn by the lights and the camera flashes. It looks like a spontaneous gathering, 
but in Conakry they say spontaneity in any gathering is encouraged by handing out banknotes. Further on, the president's special adviser tries to reassure a friend by telephone. He has just been told that he may figure on a list of people to be indicted in France. No, Mulga in the Ivory Coast, where there were more than 4,000 dead, they all come and go in France as they like. They go to the United States everywhere. We have our story straight, don't you worry. We took power eight months ago, and France shut the gate on us. That was an effort to destabilize us. The country needs to have all the necessary legal instruments. You know, this sort of thing happens in a lot of countries around the world. It's, it's a well-known trick and one that France knows. France is very good at destabilizing African countries. Back at the heart of the convoy, supporters have heard rumours of the possible arrival of an international intervention force. Daddy's camera, the Guinean people support you to the death. At the wheel, the captain tries to give the image of a man close to the people. The crowd is hysterical. The captain likes to make it known he's the country's best defence. We're going to do what needs to be done for this country. We're going to do what needs to be done. You see, that's my intervention force. Instead of an intervention force, these people are going to intervene. The destiny is phenomenal. You see here, they are defying the leaders, the false leaders. Those discredited ones who want to tarnish my image in the West. Outside, supporters chant slogans. Slogans against the elections, egged on by the presidential guard. Down with the elections. We want Dadis. He's a patriot for Guinea. Down with the election. But no, I'm going to go ahead with the elections to legitimize the future president. And it may be someone else, not me. Whoever it does turn out to be, Daddy says chief of the hunter will still be sure to have an influence in the running of the country. Virginie Ertz joins us now here in the studio at France Vincat. Virginie, let's talk about that interview that kicks off your piece. What went through your mind when you went in to start this shoot and you discovered the leader of Guinea in bed? Well, Jenny, I just couldn't believe it. Um, when I entered the room filming with my camera uh, to discover uh, the chief of the junta in his bed, um, I had applied uh, to see him at different moments of his life because I told him I would do a portrait and uh, a longer feature. So I had applied to see him at different moments of his life, private moments with his families, uh, not only official moments. So uh, it was a first surprise to see this room where he received only family members and uh, very close collaborators. Uh, but uh, then to see him in his in his bed was really surprising. And I told him that it was a surprise for me, for me but he said, well, now you can testify that ha I have a very simple life, that I don't live in lux uh, in luxurious or in luxury, luxury. in luxury. Um, uh, uh, and uh, he wanted to make the difference with a former president who was living at the presidential palace and who was uh, spending a lot of money. So he just wanted to make the difference. And I just can probably commend or say that I guess that the, the Guinean... Uh, a communication strategy is very different from the French one. Now, Captain Camera came to power in December and he was quite popular back in, in the beginning, but how do people in Guinea feel now uh, since the violence in Conakry Stadium? Do they still respect him as their leader? 
Well, I think uh, most people are really deceived, profoundly deceived. As you, as you told, he was very popular at the beginning when he took power, just after the death of the former president, who was considered as a dictator. And at that time, he promised a lot of things to fight against corruption, to fight against uh, drug trafficking, which is a big problem in Guinea. And uh, he did at the beginning, indeed. But he was also popular because he had he said that he wouldn't run for president uh, for president and for the elections. And uh, with the time, he, it's uh, it's uh, seemed that he was grabbing uh, power and uh, so people were well, step by step, were pretty deceived with his behavior. But then this uh, massacre of September 28 was really the last and the final, uh, yeah, the final um, ra uh, rift uh, the, between him and the, and the people. Mm -hmm. Now, Captain Camera has systematically said he's not responsible for that violence in Conagree Stadium a few weeks ago. But I guess the big question is, if he's not responsible for the army, then who is? Well, he accuses first uh, the opponents. He said that they knew that it could be a massacre because uh, the soldiers are not disciplined and that they are very violent sometimes. So that he says opponents bringing people, saying people to go to the stadium would be very dangerous. Then um, he says that nobody is able to control the soldiers, to control the army. But then people say, well, he, if he is not able to control the army, then is he really able to uh, govern a country? Mm -hmm. And uh, some some of the opponents have really testified that uh, uh, very uh, close collaborators of him, uh, Ed de Caen, so his special assistant and one of his nephew, were at the stadium uh, when it happened, and that uh, Dadis Camara could not, uh, well, could not know what was happening, and that at least he could have called to stop this massacre. All right, thank you so much, Virginie Hertz, for that behind the scenes look at Guinean leader Moussa Dadis Camara. That wraps up this edition of Reporters. Be sure to tune in again next week for more great stories from our France Vat journalists from around the world.